Uh, what I'm hoping to achieve in this presentation is to show you that we have been using uh, the big, big data concept uh, well before big data became a buzzword. So I'll take you through the history of the project uh, that we operate and maintain, and also talk to you about uh, what we use the data for, and also some of our data challenges. Uh, South Florida Water Management District, we are the largest water management district in Florida. I have a map there showing uh, our other uh, sister agencies as well. We have representatives from those uh, agencies as well. We cover about 16 counties from Orlando area all the way to uh, Miami-Dade. Uh, the boundaries are not political boundaries, they are actually basin and base, base boundaries. So they are based on the hydrology, uh, each basin. Uh, is somewhat independent, at least as far as surface water. Groundwater, there are a lot of interactions. And we are based in West Palm Beach, and we also have uh, satellite offices uh, throughout our district. Um, as, as I mentioned, the largest water management agency in, uh, in Florida. Our mission is really to manage and protect the water resources of the region by doing two main things. One is to balance, the other one is to improve water quality, flood control, natural system, and water supply. I know it's a mouthful, it's, it's a very complex mission. Uh, one of our biggest uh, challenge is actually uh, balancing those mission elements. Uh, because sometimes when you're trying to provide flood control, you're actually impacting water supply or vice versa. So that's a, that's a big challenge for us. Uh, and, and those challenges become even more challenging with increasing development and, and increased public awareness of environmental values. Uh, everybody uh, is aware of um, ecosystem services these days, everybody has a smart device, you open any gates, they are aware of what you're doing, so uh, there's a lot of scrutiny on uh, just day-to-day -day, uh, water operations. Uh, the history, again, early explorer in South Florida recognized the value and the challenges. Uh, I have this uh, cartoon showing the emblematic figure of uh, Uncle Sam with Miss Florida overlooking the Everglade. Essentially, it's a, if you can drain them, you can have them. Uh, so you get the picture earlier on, at the turn of the century, the folks was just drain the land so we can live here. Uh, that was the, uh, really the emphasis in those days. Um, with that development, even though it progressed a lot in the 20th century, pressure incru to increase uh, drain draining the region increased, but there were still a lot of problems. Floodings, drought persisted. Uh, there was also a lot of soil sub subsidence, uh, particularly in the EA region. Let's see. Uh, so I'm going to take you through just some uh, key uh, water resources problem for the region that led to uh, the water management system we have today. Um, I'm going to start with actually water supply. Uh, mostly in the 30s and 40s, the lower east coast experienced a lot of saltwater intrusion. Uh, but as far as flood control, there were two, uh, two main events. Where in the mid-20s, there was a series of hurricanes, 1926 and 1928 hurricane, uh, that uh, resulted in loss of lives up to 2,500 people died. Uh, there was also the 1947 storm I'll get into in a second. Uh, but the mid-20s, as a result of this uh, hurricane, Herbert uh, Hoover, who was president at that time, visited South Florida, uh, and he authorized the Hoover Dike. That's the dike that the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers constructed to bas basically protect the southern portion uh, of the lake. What I'm showing on this map is the Lake Okeechobee, which is the heart of the system, and it shows in blue here areas that were flooded as a result of a 26 and 28 storm. Uh, you can see area like Clewiston, Bell Glade, were all underwater. Like I said, a lot of people lo lost their lives. Uh, the Hoover Dike essentially initially covered the southern portion of the lake to protect those communities that are starting to appear south of the lake. Uh, and then came the 1947 storm. Uh, that's really the storm that changed water management for good in central and southern Florida. Uh, the result of that storm essentially uh, is shown here in blue, area from Orlando all the way to Miami were underwater. Uh, and that really what uh, changed fundamentally how we manage water in, in, in central and southern Florida. Uh, as a result of that storm, the Everglades Drainage District, which was uh, the, the drainage district that was in existence at that time, issued a, a report that had a, a whipping cow on its cover, essentially saying, enough is enough, we need some help. Uh, they requested uh, the federal government to, to take action. And that's how the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers got involved and uh, started uh, what is known as the Central and Southern Florida uh, Project. And what I'm showing there is essentially a map of that original project. It was uh, 
essentially authorized by the U.S. Congress through a series of flood control acts spanning from the late 40s to the mid-60s uh, to build a massive water management system, like I said, going from Orlando area all the way to Miami. Uh, it's essentially a series of canals, uh, water control structure, dams, pump stations, essentially to better manage water for flood control and other purposes. I'll get into those purposes in a second. Uh, and uh, the Central and Southern Florida Flood Control District, which later became the, the South Florida Water Management District, was also created by Florida legislature uh, to serve as the local sponsor and to operate and maintain the system. Uh, so that, that was essentially big engineering, which led to big data. Later on, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, as I mentioned, the project had multiple purposes, flood control, water supply navigation, prevention of saltwater intrusion, and protection of fish and wildlife. It was built by the Corps uh, from the late 40s to the mid 70s, and today we operate and maintain this system. Uh, we have uh, essentially control over 85, 90 percent of the system. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers still operate some of the major infrastructure along the federal uh, waterways uh, around Lake Okeechobee primarily, and uh, around the water conservation areas. Uh, it just shows the general direction of flow, water flow from Orlando area through the Kissimmee River, get to the lake. We send it either east west or south. Uh, recent improvement include stormwater treatment area. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with those. Those are essentially constructed wetland uh, that we use to clean the water before we send it to the Everglades protective areas. Uh, and uh, they are huge. Uh, they, they may look small on a map, but they cover about 60, 65,000 acres of land. Uh, so if you are in South Florida, I highly suggest uh, stopping by and looking at them. They're pretty impressive. They also change fundamentally how we manage the water. It used to be we we get water, we just kind of flush it, send it to tide. Uh, now, no, it's not that simple. We got to hold it, we got to treat it. We, you have to do a lot of uh, operation that we didn't, didn't do before. So it, it changed a lot how we manage the system. So the, today's system is really more than the original Central and Southern Florida project. As I mentioned, I'm just giving you some numbers here. I uh, apologize, some of these numbers are, are in SI unit because I gave this uh, presentation uh, in the Netherlands a few months ago. Uh, but that's about 20... 2,600 miles of canals and levee, a lot of drainage basin, uh, thousands of water control structure, uh, a lot of st stormwater pump station. We also have a regional telemetry system. I'll talk about that in a second, which is uh, somewhat unique. Uh, and we cover 16 counties. The original system was built for about 2.5 million. Today we serve about 7.5 million. So that's about 40, 45% of uh, uh, the state of Florida population. So there's a, a big chunk of urbanized area that we serve, uh, and also a lot of natural area. I think someone mentioned this. We, we serve uh, three national parks, Biscayne National Park, Big Cypress, and Everglade National Park. So the water quality aspect also is very important. So the mission has ballooned from the early days where it was primarily flood control to really an overall water, holistic water management system. And we also serve a lot of uh, multiple secondary drainage system, and I'll talk about this uh, in a second. That also make the management of the water uh, very complex. Uh, essentially, the system is, is such that it's what I call system within a regional water management system. What we have is we manage the primary system, but we have the secondary and tertiary system that depend on us. So they send water to, to us. The primary system is essentially managed by us and the core. The secondary system will be local government, counties, cities. It will also be special districts. Uh, and the tertiary system is essentially homeowner association, private landowners. Uh, so it's a three-tiered system uh, with each one of them ha having its own uh, capacity and uh, complexity in its own. So um, just to give you an idea of that complexity, I'm showing here uh, the system with all the secondary district on the map here. So secondary district, we call them 298 because they're created by the Florida legislature, chapter 298. We have 70 plus of those. Uh, you can see the color here. Uh, Broward and uh, Palm Beach County have the largest number of uh, secondary systems. Again, they depend on us for their drainage. Uh, typically, when there is a flooding, it's those tertiary secondary system that get flooded first before the primary system get overwhelmed. Uh, this is just zooming in on Broward County alone to get, g give you a sense of uh, skills of what we're talking about. Again, in Broward alone, we have 22 uh, secondary drainage district that are shown here in different colors. Uh, and then every little blue 
color you see here, it's either a canal or a, a pond in somebody's backyard. Uh, like I said, when flooding occurs, typically happens in those tertiary system first before the secondary and, and primary system get overwhelmed. So when there is a storm approaching or during a storm, there is a great deal of communication, a lot of data exchange between us and the secondary system. Uh, in turn, the secondary system also exchange a lot of information and data with the homeowner association. So it's a really multi-layer system uh, that's very complex in its own right. Uh, as far as data, again, we have our primary system data. We have some of the secondary data uh, as well. But one of the biggest challenges with tertiary and secondary system are not all uh, on telemetry. They're not all automated. So some of the data are manually collected. Uh, I'll talk about that uh, as well. Uh, but really, we're talking about very complex system. Just on the flood control mission alone, let it, uh, I'm not even talking about water quality and environmental restoration aspect of it. Uh, now, I'm going to talk a little bit about source of data. So when we talk about water data, we think of water data uh, as coming from different sources. Uh, a lot of people are used to the traditional uh, monitoring network. So we have complex monitoring network, hydrometeorological, water quality, ecological. The, the data can be real time. It could be near real time. It could be just historical. We also have a concept of directly monitored data versus derived data. And this is very important because some data are basically coming from a sensor in the field. We, they come in, they get to our control center, and it's bas basically data that's measured directly. But then you have derived data like the flow, how much water we move through a structure. Typically, that's not directly monitored. It's something that you, you estimate. From hydraulic equation, you know whatever the water level is upstream and downstream of a structure, you have derived data. Uh, evapotranspiration is another example. Uh, loads of uh, contaminant is another example. So you have data that's directly monitored and you also have derived data. We also have a big chunk of data that come through models, and that's, that's, a, that's a big source of data. And we have very complex models, ranging from one-dimensional to fully three-dimensional models. Some are physically based, some are statistically based. We have regional, sub-regional, and localized type of models, uh, and uh, with a whole host of data that are used to run those models. And then we have water infrastructure information, essentially information about where do you have your structures, what are the elevations, uh, uh, what type of structure do you have? Where are your canals? What are your levees? What are your reservoirs, your lakes, and, and so on and so forth? Um, and then in, increasingly, this is an area that's getting a little bit of traction. We haven't done as much as we need to, in my opinion, is the area of crowd hydrology. Essentially, the concept of getting the public involved. When there is a storm with their smart devices, they go read a staff gauge, or they just take a picture. They say, hey, in my backyard, look like the water is g coming out of banks, or it's getting close to flooding getting that information to us. It's happening slowly, but it's not where it needs to be. I think that's an area that big data can be incredibly useful in managing water resources. And all that information, obviously, is thrown into water management decision. And those water management decisions are taken on different, uh, a different temporal and spatial scale. What I mean by that is sometimes you're taking real-time operation decision where someone is calling and say, can I open this gate? Can I turn on this pump? Versus uh, long-term decisions such as this dry season, do we release water from Lake Okeechobee? So uh, by the time we get into the wet season, the lake is not too high. So you have decisions that are sub-hourly type of decision to monthly, sometimes annual to decadal type of decisions. So those are also some of the challenges. How do you make those decisions with uh, complex information that are coming in? Now, in my next few slides, I'll just talk about some of the data use. Uh, we do know what to do with our data. I heard a lot about, well, we collect data, we don't know what to do with it. That's just not the case for us. We do know what to do with it. In my opinion, our biggest issue is not, not knowing what to do with the data, is can we do mo more with our data? That's really the, the key question for us. Is I, s I feel we sit on gold mine of data, but we're not mining those gold mine of data as we should. That's really the biggest issue. And I think a lot of agencies run into that. Uh, we have data that have been collecting over over decades, uh, and it's sitting there. We, we use it for real-time operation, but there is more we could do with that data. Uh, one of the things we did, uh, as I mentioned, that's somewhat unique, is we have our own telemetry network. What that means is we build our own towers. And the reason behind it is uh, it's because of hurricanes. We don't go to AT&T or, or Sprint and say, can we lease a tower from you? Because we need to have towers that are robust enough that it, in case of a cut four, cut five storm, we still will be able to talk to our structure and have information, our fingertip to make decision. Uh, so it's our own microwave tower system. 
uh, that come with its own challenges, but it's a very robust system that serves us really well since the mid 80s. Uh, with that real time op data, we can automate a lot of the functions. Uh, for example, we're able to reduce uh, staffing at a pump station, we're able to consolidate a lot of the uh, pumping operation from multiple pumps and operate them from one, one localized control center. And we also have obviously our overall control center uh, at the headquarters where decisions are made. We also use a lot of uh, models, tools, um, a whole suite of them, from in-house grown models to off-the-shelf models uh, to models from universities and, and so on and so forth. I just listed some of them. We have a two-by-two -two model called South Florida Water Management Model. We have a regional simulation models. We use other tools like MyShe, Mic11, Hecras, just depending on the application, depending on the need. Uh, and those are very data-intensive type of application, obviously. We also use data for decision support uh, type of uh, tools. For example, we have something called data-derived set point. What it does is it essentially if we lose control over a structure during a storm, the structure is smart enough to control itself. So let's say we cannot talk to a spillway that's in Miami and then in the middle of a storm, we cannot really tell it to open a gate. There is a program that tells the structure, okay, control room cannot talk to you right now. You are on your own. So it knows when you reach a certain criteria, it's going to have to go and open the gate on its own. Uh, it's something we don't like to use, but sometimes we have to use it because uh, of emergency conditions. Uh, we do flood forecasting tool development. I'm showing here a map of uh, Big Cypress Basin where we have uh, a real-time uh, for forecasting model for looking at the next six hours, the next 12 hours, what kind of uh, water level to expect depending on what uh, the storm may be doing. We, we run typically scenarios that say if we get a two-inch storm, what kind of water elevation sh uh, are we going to be seeing, or if we get six inches of, uh, of water. Uh, one thing that we are also doing in light of uh, sea level rise and climate change, we are reassessing the water management system capacity and limitation. We have a, uh, a project called level of service. Essentially, we're looking at flood control level of service in urbanized area, reassessing the capacity of a system in light of all the ch and changes, not just sea level rise, but also land use changes, uh, rainfall frequency changes. It's a very challenging project. We just finished a pilot in, in uh, Miami-Dade. Uh, we are hoping to extend it to the entire urbanized area. Essentially, the idea is to look at a system that's 60 plus years old and understand what is it capable of today, what needs to, to change with the system to be able to meet the need of a growing population and uh, changing uh, climate. Um, as I mentioned, most uh, water control structures are remotely operated from the control center. We also use uh, for seasonal type of decision making, we use multi-objective regulation schedule. Uh, we're very proud uh, to be one of the very first agency, probably nationwide, that start using climate outlook in our, uh, in our decision making for long-term decision making. If we have an El Nino year or a La Nina year, what kind of uh, seasonal strategy are, you, are we gonna use? Are we going to start moving water from the lakes? Are we going to wait? Uh, the challenge with those, obviously, is uncertainty was climate outlook. We get those climate data from the Climate uh, Prediction Center. Sometimes they get it right, sometimes they don't. And it's, it's a very big challenge for us. But we do use those climate outlook in our decision making. Uh, we, use, we produce something called a position analysis. What it is is a probabilistic uh, projection of what the lake is going to look like. If this is it's going to look like in the next 12 months. Essentially, it shows us what is the 50 percentile line for the lake, uh, what is the 5 percentile, what is the 95 percentile. Essentially, give us some projection. Yes, they are probabilistic, but give us some idea where the lake may be going. Since the lake is the center of the system, it, it helps us uh, at least come up with long-term strategy. Uh, like I said, because of climate uh, uncertainty, we don't always get it right, but we, we do have tools that help us uh, get closer to reality. Uh, it's an area where big data can be very useful as well. Uh, we also have you know, the innovative application uh, of, of uh, data analysis tool. One example uh, is what is called the I model. It was developed by one of my colleagues, Alali. And essentially what it is is an artificial neural network and optimization techniques that it's not physically based, it's statistically based, but it helps uh, look at multiple project infrastructure and operation options which one is meeting uh, criteria, which one is not. I'm just showing here in red that a specific scenario where the targets were not met, but here you see all the dots are green. Under that scenario, all the targets were met. 
Again, it's a screening tool. It's not physically based, but it gives us a really good sense of uh, what kind of uh, operational changes are needed to meet certain targets. They could be flood control targets. They could be environmental. Uh, the model won a number of awards. Uh, apologize for that. This thing is just going really fast. Uh, the model won a number of awards, and nowadays is actually taught at uh, Columbia University. Um, and then National Science Foundation is also using it as part of the HydroViz project. Uh, so it, it is uh, gaining some visibility. Uh, another um, use of data that's very intensive, we do, somewhat unique, some, some agencies start doing it, but we were a pioneer in doing this, is to use uh, computational fleet dynamics. What that is, is uh, it's the same tool that are used to design airplanes. If you flew to this conference, uh, chances are the airplane you flew in used CFD when they were designing it. We use the same um, similar tool. The same, we basically, we're solving the fully three-dimensional equation that are called Reynolds Average Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, these are really very refined models that solve the flow field near a structure. What I'm showing here, essentially, uh, is one of our spillway. You see the baffle block. We could have as many as 5 million node points. We solve a system of uh, nonlinear partial differential equations. You could have as much as six uh, partial differential equation solve on a six mi uh, five million grid. Uh, the computation can be anywhere from a few days to three weeks. We don't have a supercomputer. We run this on a, a, a Linux uh, cluster. I, I heard someone mention somebody about something about a supercomputer in, at UF that's very powerful. I would love to talk to them. The, uh, this is <laughs> the kind of simulation that could be very ideal for that. But the point is, this is an intensive use of data where it help us design the infrastructure, but more importantly, um, prioritize it because we have thousands of structures on a given year. We don't have money to, f to repair or fix all of them. You really have to know which one are the most uh, vulnerable, the most susceptible to failure. Tools like this help us uh, understand those questions. Uh, and like I said, uh, it's a lot of data. It's in, in the terabyte range. Yeah, we are on the low range as far as big data, but we are using bi big data. It's just not all in, in, in one place. Uh, another thing we use uh, computational dynamics for is we also look at in-lake dynamics. Uh, this is Lake Okeechobee simulation using what we call Lake Okeechobee environmental models. Uh, essentially what it looks like, uh, look at is, is the sediment concentration and, and the sediment dynamics and also the large scale circulation pattern within the lake. Uh, why are we doing this? How, why, how is this useful? It helped us actually understand what is happening to sediment under major storm. What we found out is anytime we get a cold front that's pushing, say, 15, 16 miles per hour wind, there's a lot of stirring that happened within the lake, uh, and it created a lot of turbidity current for us. And uh, we have to be very mindful of those, because if we open those gate, that those turbidity current will end up in our STAs, uh, can damage the vegetation. We have to, to know what's happening in real time to, to make decision on when to open the gates and when not to open them. It also helps us understand what our uh, hurricane do to the lake. Uh, in the aftermath of a 04, 05 hurricane, we saw a huge spike in sediment concentration because, again, the lake just gets stirred up and it t took years before it, it get back to where it need to. Tools like this help us uh, understand those uh, large scale phenomena. Uh, this is again just uh, some of the result of that Lake Okeechobee simulation. It shows just the depth, and then this is a picture on the same day of the lake, a satellite picture during a drought. Uh, another thing we incrementally are using data for is sea level rise issue. Like I mentioned, we have a project where we are assessing the capacity of a system. Uh, and looking at what are the most vulnerable area within our system. What structure need to be uh, looked at, which one need to be increased, if we need to increase them by how much, which canal we need to improve, where do we need detention areas. Uh, it's an ambitious undertaking, but it's something we need to do in light of sea level rise. Uh, what happened to us, and it's happening to a lot of agencies, the system it was designed, like I said, 60, 70 years ago, and it's primarily gravity-driven system. What that means is if a sea level rises, you lose that head, you need to push water out to sea. So you either end up pumping it or designing a new infrastructure. What I'm showing there is just 15 minute data where the water level in red is on the downstream side of the structure, in blue is on the upstream side of structure. Every time the red uh, basically encompasses the blue, you have a problem, you have an issue. 
today there are times where we tell people we, we cannot open those gates because if we open them, you're going to be in worse shape. We've got to close them for a few hours till the tides subside. Uh, and that's getting worse and worse. At some point, it's not going to be acceptable to do that. Uh, the communities, the counties understand that. The city understand that. They are working closely with us. It's a long-term project, but it's something we need to do. Uh, come up with uh, adaptation strategy. Uh, at some point, people will have to retreat as well, but that's, that's another meeting, another discussion. But uh, that's, again, another application of uh, big data. Uh, now, I'm just going to end my presentation with some of the challenges, some of the things that we're seeing that are uh, affecting us. Some of them may be common to other agencies as well. I think uh, my colleagues from the Netherlands mentioned this. A common platform and integrating multiple uh, databases and application. What happened is we have a lot of uh, databases, up to 10, 15 uh, databases, huge. Some of them are in the half terabyte, terabyte range. Uh, but they were developed for different purposes over the years and decades. Now we're saying, hey, it's time to put all this together. How can we integrate them? Uh, but uh, part of the discussion also that's not talked about a lot is the application be behind these databases. Big data to us is not just data. It's data and the tools that are used to extract that data and manipulate that data, pull information out of that data. Those applications need to be revisited, retire some, uh, improve some. Uh, we have a project in IT where they're doing what's called a hydro data roadmap, where they're revisiting how to remap that whole architecture. Um, technology was not cooperating with me. I was going to show you what it looks like. It's, it's, it's really uh, incredible if you look at it, how many databases and how many applications were developed over the years. Uh, another thing that's not talked about a whole lot, and I think uh, Steve touched on this, is the veracity part of big data. What is the quality of that data? Not all data are created equal. So we got to keep that in mind. Uh, how do you do quality assurance and quality control of that data? If it's inaccurate data, to me, it's almost like worthless. If it's accurate data, it's priceless. Uh, you just got to have tools that can do that uh, data QAQC part. We have a project where we're looking at developing automated data processing tool. What that means is when we collect data from the field, it always comes with anomalies. There is no such thing as a perfect data. There's always some issues. Uh, the problem is we tend to manually try to fix those anomaly. Uh, th those days are almost over. We just don't have a human capital to keep doing that. We got to have tools that can actually automatically uh, process that information with specific business rules that say, look, if a stage is in this range, drop it. I don't want to have it in my, in my data. It just it doesn't make sense. There is something wrong. Maybe it got hit by lightning. Maybe a frog jumped into that stealing well. Something happened, I need that data out of my database. Um, so that's a, an area we're very interested in and we're glad to talk to anybody who's involved in automated data processing. Uh, developing data integration and analysis tool to extract useful, timely, and actionable information. Steve mentioned this. You got the data layer and then you got the information layer and then knowledge and wisdom. Going from that data layer to the information layer is very critical. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I feel like we sit on gold mines of data that, that have been collected for decades. We're not using it as much as we, uh, we need to. Yes, we have a lot of great tools, but it's not enough. We need to do more with that data. Uh, it's what I call so many data, so little information. Um, another challenge is integrated, uh, integrating data from various temporal and spatial scale using physically based model. What, what, what that means is, you have models that are applicable, let's say, for flood control. They're sub-hourly, sometimes minutes type of models. And then you have models that you need to apply for multiple decades. Those are not the same model. It's not the same physics. It's not the same phenomena. But yet, you're trying to integrate them to make decisions. Uh, that's a big challenge. Same thing with uh, the spatial skill. You have localized model where we're looking at data, sub-meter level type of data to 16 counties. Uh, so that's... That's a challenge. Uh, the last one may seem trivial to a, a lot of you, but it's a big issue for us because uh, we get data coming from different data, 88 survey or a 29 survey. When you do that, there are errors that are a few tenths of a foot difference. In most places in the country, that's not a big deal. But in Miami-Dade, a tenth of a foot can mean somebody getting flooded or someone not getting flooded. So when we convert from different elevation data, those uh, subtle differences can have a major impact. 
So that's uh, my talk. I'll leave you with uh, a quote here in line with uh, the Dutch looking water as an enemy and sometimes looking water as a, as a friend. A guy a lot smarter than me said, water is a very good servant, but it's also a cruel master. Thank you. <laughs>